All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an awesome time so far. Our next speaker is Kasturi Kanan. He is an associate professor at the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage. Hi, I'm Kasturi Kanan and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology. And uh, today I'm going to talk about one of the very important topics that is bordering artificial intelligence and computational pathology. And that is uh, uh, an integration between histopathology and omics data using what is known as a spatial point process. Uh, before going into the topic, I would like to give you a background of my credentials. I graduated with a PhD uh, in computer science at, from Texas A&M University. And then um, I uh, did my postdoctoral uh, research at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where I discovered uh, some of the key, um, uh, uh, key molecules in, uh, in brain tumors. And that led me to a faculty position at NYU. Um, and then that led me to a current position at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where I direct the computational pathology program in the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology. So I have a lots of experience doing data science, machine learning, and uh, uh, a kind of uh, things. So uh, before going into the topic, uh, I would like to give you a brief preview of why this topic is important. Um, uh, I, I'm suppose, I suppose everyone in the audience believes math is awesome, right? So there is one cool theorem which is called uh, the P and the Sun. There is even a book about it. It's called the banach tarskis paradox. So what it means that is that uh, you can take a P and then break it into pieces and then assemble into to Sun. In fact, you can assemble it into any shape that you want. And it is a real theorem in mathematics. So if you think about it, are we living in the world of matrix? Uh, this is possible. And uh, this is possible because there are some existence of what is known as a non-measurable sets. Uh, those are very intricate, deep, abstract mathematics. But if you look anything that is in the world of computation, everything is measurable. So, so there are some things uh, that are really non-applicable mathematics and there are really applicable mathematics. And uh, the topic today is, is bordering what is known as a, a probably a non-applicable mathematics, but it's extremely useful uh, when it comes to uh, uh, applying that in terms of, uh, you know, translating that in terms of computations. And that is known as a spatial point process. So um, the, the today's talk, I'm going to briefly go over what is known as uh, spatial point processes. And then um, this, uh, I'm going to talk about omics data integration using spatial point processes, and then a real application of it uh, in brain tumors and how this can be used uh, to, to integrate as well as understand uh, brain tumors. And that's the topic for today. So uh, the motivation for the spatial point process, uh, it's very simple. Uh, you can think about a tropical rainforest or you can think of Milky Way galaxy. So, you know, in terms of stars or it could be trees, it could be cells. It doesn't matter. It's an arrangement of points at the end of the day. Now, uh, one key question that we can ask is that are the points uniformly spread over a region or uh, the density of point depend on certain variables, right? Is there evidence of clustering? Is there evidence of uh, regularity or uh, is it randomly distributed, right? Uh, or uh, is it consistent with my scientific hypothesis and how reliable it is? So all these questions can be answered uh, using spatial point process methods. But the key thing to note about this methods is that it is not about the points themselves. It is how the points were generated in the first place. We believe there is a process, right? You can throw a, do uh, a die and it, you can expect to have uh, six outcomes out of it. Or you can throw a, a flip a coin and you can get either heads or tails out of it, right? So it's inherently what is known as a random variable. It's a, it's a numerical quantity, right? And um, uh, it is inherently variable. It comes with a distribution, uh, so to speak, in terms of mathematics. So point process is a simple uh, uh, mechanism where the outcome is a point pattern. So all of these things would correspond to a single uh, point process. So whatever that we see is not actually the set of points, but it only a representation of a set of points. It's from a, a Monte Carlo, it's called realization, but uh, but anyway, we don't need to go into deeper mathematics of it. But uh, in general, we can assume that uh, 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 if you see a pattern, it's just one of the representations of multiples of uh, the process, uh, the multiple realizations of that process. So we can ask several key questions. And one of the simple question is that uh, about a binomial process. A binomial process is, uh, you know, the idea is that the points are independent. 
uh, and as well as uh, uh, they are spread uniformly over a region. So uh, for a given region, we can estimate what is the probability of the distribution, um, uh, probability of a point being in a region or not. And that will follow the classical binomial, uh, 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 binomial theorem, right? So uh, that is called as a, bi a binomial process. But there is something called a complete spatial randomness, which has, assumes homogeneity, which means that the points will not have any preference in the spatial location. Or, and it is independent, right? Uh, the information about the outcome in one region does not influence the other, right? So, so uh, the, the key observation is that the binomial process does not have this independence. So given K points in a region, there is no other way that the N minus K points have to lie outside of that region, right? So, so but then this is a, this doesn't happen in the real world, it's only a null model. It's only a, a null hypothesis that you know in the in the ideal world, if everything is random, let's say that you are throwing some vegetables on a pizza, it's going to follow a complete spatial randomness. Now uh, we can estimate the probability distribution of what it, what it is, and uh, for a for a complete spatial randomness, it follows uh, what is known as a Poisson process. I mean, this is a classic uh, a theorem from famous probability uh, theory that uh, uh, result from probability theory that. Uh, the probability of the expected number of points, uh, if there are large enough points, it will follow a Poisson distribution. So, so we, in general, in mathematical terms, you can think of complete spatial randomness as synonymous with the Poisson process. And uh, this is a homogeneous Poisson process. Now we can relax the condition of homogeneity, meaning that um, not all locations receive exactly the same number of points, but then there could be a points that depends on the area. And that uh, is known as an inhomogeneous Poisson process. Still, the key assumption is that uh, all the points are independent. So the outcome of one does not affect the outcome of other, but still you can have a inhomogeneity in uh, the distribution of points. And there are so many methods uh, to, to simulate that, right? So, um, in, uh, so, this, uh, uh, so, so the simulation of inhomogeneity, the inhomogeneity is a, is a it's, this is a very relaxed uh, model and it's been applied in several of uh, 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 methods or uh, you know, real world applications, right? Uh, so for instance, if it has a homogeneous intensity, all it means is a constant, right? And if there are different in different regions, we can assign different constants in there. And uh, the exponential function of a covariate too, right? So there are uh, lots of these things that can be modeled based on the inhomogeneous Poisson process. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, when I'm, I'm when I'm talking about points, it could you can you can substitute with cells, or if you are an eco, uh, if you are working in ecology, you can uh, uh, you can uh, interpret it as trees, or if you are working in astronomy, you can interpret it as stars. Uh, all the things remain the same; it doesn't matter. I'm talking about the general point process theory. So uh, when we have these uh, covariate, uh, you know there are so many ways that you can um, uh, model this po Poisson process, uh, inhomogeneous Poisson process. Now uh, the conditional inter the, the covariate is in general right what affects in general all the points like you can think of soil fertility so uh, you know a tropical rainforest terrain uh, can have a, a set of variates that can uniformly vary over the region right so those are covariates and for example here uh, we can uh, uh, ask the question does these specific trees Welsh media trees prefer steep or flat uh, location and we can answer these questions using um, uh, uh, point process methods. Now uh, we recall that one of the key things about the complete spatial randomness is that there are two things one is the notion of homogeneity and the notion of independence right. Now a homogeneity can be relaxed and uh, as you saw it's the inhomogeneous Poisson process. But the notion of independence is too stringent, actually, right? To relax. Uh, uh, in the real world, you expect a non-homogeneous and uh, non-independent processes. That's how the real world is run. So there are two ways that we can relax this uh, thing. One is known as uh, the Coxman cluster processes. You make the intensity as random, right? So if you make the intensity as random, it is no longer uh, independent, right? So it's, it's a completely in, uh, random. And those are doubly stochastic processes like Cox and cluster processes. Or, the another way is to make the intensity conditional. So you put a conditional probability, right? Like it's a, it's a Bayesian uh, approach where you say that, hey, this is a given a point, given you take away the rest of points, what is the probability that this point is going to be here, right? So that is, you make uh, the conditional intensity and that is going to give you uh, uh, a, a, a totally different types of processes. And those processes are known as an inhibitory processes, although it's not just going to be inhibitions in there. And those are Gibbs, Strauss, and Geyer processes. 
So uh, to give you an idea of what is a Gibbs process is that uh, uh, you have a, a set of points in there and there is a radius and outside of this radius, there are no points in there, but only within this radius, you will have some points in there. That is known as a Gibbs hardcore process. So, you know, there is a hardcore uh, uh, radius within which no points can come. Now, uh, there is a generalization of those Gibbs process, which is known as a cross process. Instead of having a hardcore radius, uh, we can have saying that a probability, you can assign a probability saying that it is improbable for a point to be coming uh, very close to another point. Okay, so it's not impossible, but rather improbable. And those model will lead to what is known as a Strauss process. But the biggest problem with the Strauss process is that it will not allow clustering. These are inhibition models, you know, point cannot come inside, right? So, uh, so you can relax that uh, using what is known as a Geyer process. You can introduce one more parameter to uh, introduce clustering as well. So this is known as a saturation parameter. So in general, Geyer process is a generalization of the Strauss process and, the, and uh, Strauss is a generalization of Gibbs. So all these models in general can be called as a Gibbs models because it's based on uh, inhibitions. So uh, what this has to do all with the data integration and uh, you know, genomics that we are talking about. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of this subject. It can be used for integration, data integration. Uh, so there is yet another thing from what is known as a covariate, uh, but there is also what is known as a marks, marks or annotations, right? It's a very powerful framework for biology. Not just the cells, you can associate uh, a cells, uh, not just the points, you can associate some information about the points, uh, annotate with them. For instance, this could be cells. And that could be, uh, you know, you can uh, say that, oh, this cell is a gastric cell and this cell is an endo uh, endothelial cell or a glial cell, right? You can, you can have various information for the points. This is different from covariates. Covariates in general um, uh, change the entire, uh, uh, you know, landscape of these points, but marks or attributes, like for instance, a tree could have a diameter of 16 and, uh, and the, height, uh, uh, the height of 16 and a diameter of two. Right, these are properties of each in every uh, uh, points in there, uh, or trees in there, and these are called uh, uh, these are called marked uh, point processes, and these are different from covariates, and they could be re really uh, powerful framework for uh, for for uh, integration. So, for example, some of them could be dendritic cells, and some of them could be uh, macrophages. So, what it has to do with uh, uh, pathology? Right, uh, so histopathology, right? When you have this HNE images and you can have the segmented image of this uh, 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 of these cells, right? You can do an image processing and do a segmentation. And for instance, here uh, I did a segmentation using EB image and also method of thresholding, and we can uh, represent it as a marked point process, and then use these uh, centroids of these cells, right? Uh, we can have various genomic annotations for this. Some of the cells could express EGFR, some could be an IDH mutant. IDH is one of the commonly uh, mutated um, uh, genes in, uh, in brain tumors. And P53, it's about 70% of the tumors have mutations in P53. So in general, you can um, assign these uh, genotypes, uh, so to speak. Uh, for these cells. And then uh, we can try to see how the distribution of these varies. In general, this is a very powerful method for understanding uh, the distribution of these cells, right? So, um, and so once you fit these models, you can try to identify how these, uh, uh, how these cells behave and the segregation behaves, right? For instance, here I annotated with the EGFR, IDH mutant, IDH wild type, and P53. And we can see the segregation of these cells, uh, how this happens by fitting a Strauss process to this, right? Once we have this, we can have the proliferation of cells. We can understand how the cells are proliferating. I mean, tumor is a, at the end of the day, uh, loss of uh, uh, contact inhibition of proliferation and loss of contact inhibition of locomotion. So these are the things that could be studied uh, using the spatial point process methods. And how fast does the proliferation happen? If you have the time points, we can take it different uh, time points and then understand uh, the proliferation, uh, uh, how fast the cells proliferate, right? So uh, heterogeneity, right? Human heterogeneity is one of the biggest questions in uh, cancer now. And we can uh, try to understand the cell-to-cell -cell repulsion interaction uh, when it comes to diffuse brain tumors called gliomas. And for instance, in the tumors of epithelial origin um, where uh, clustering could be facilitated that you could apply cluster processes like I mentioned before, right? Making the conditional, making the intensity as random. 
and then it is natural to apply in the setting of clonal evolution right uh, the, the, it's it's not been um, the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, it's it's not been applied uh, yet in a, in a large scale fashion although here and there there are literature doing spatial uh, analysis but uh, 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 integration of pathology and uh, spatial point process in a large scale setting has not been taken and uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, we can compare. We don't need to understand what is a fundamental process for all these. We can't figure it out because uh, uh, a point pattern could be arising out of two different processes. But when we have the control and experiment, we can compare them using these, right? So uh, I applied uh, this uh, technique uh, to GBM. So I was really wanting to know what is the pattern of these brain tumor uh, pathology. Uh, is. So what I did was I took the uh, glioblastoma, that's the, my research experience have been working on brain tumors and glioblastomas are the most malignant and aggressive tumors. Uh, uh, so out of, uh, it, it largely comprises of about 60% uh, of gliomas uh, uh, can be attributed to the brain tumors and, uh, and uh, it, it has a median survival of 14 months. It's very, very aggressive. And uh, I thought I should study uh, uh, the pattern, the spatial uh, patterns of these uh, brain tumors. And so I downloaded and processed about 411 GBM diagnostic images. Uh, and this is an algorithm. I resolved until like 50 micrometers and randomly chose about 300 micrometer area. And then I applied the mask, converted that into a spatial object. And then I evaluated the statistics uh, as well as uh, uh, I found the, uh, I fit the Geyer process inhibition model to see how this is, right? So at this point, one might actually question uh, what uh, uh, the key question that one might ask is that what is the basis of all this, right? I mean, I have, I'm randomly resolving 50 micrometers and 300 micrometers choosing an area of 300 micrometers and what's the basis for all this, right? What is the resolution of the image that we should work with? And how do we know all these 50 micrometers or 300 micrometers is uh, appropriate for our analysis? And that is where uh, the, the real beauty of spatial point process comes in, right? So uh, the, well, there's something called the Ripley's K function. That's pr it's pretty popular among uh, several uh, domains. So for instance, in uh, wolf pack, uh, uh, you know, when we consider wolf packs in the wild, when you zoom it into like zero to 50 kilometers, you see that there are only separate, right? Disparate. But when you zoom in closer, you see that actually this each dot is actually comprised of several wolf packs. So, uh, so the, the thing is that it is very clustered at small scales and very dispersed at large scales, right? Um, the, the thing is that nearest neighbor techniques would not be able to um, get this, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, resolve this or uh, give us statistics that we can analyze these old pack data. So some of these uh, met metrics like taking the density or uh, these are first order statistics uh, or, or taking this, uh, Cluster, uh, you know, um, uh, or uh, uh, for instance, nearest neighbor, those will not work. So we need to have uh, multiple scales of information without some form of reaggregation, and that's where these K and L functions come in, right? Uh, so uh, that also takes the scale uh, as a variable. So what is an expected number of points at a distance h? That is a question that we are asking. And uh, the expected number will not be meaningful if we don't divide by the density. So we divide by the density and this K function is the expected number of points around any point at a specific location. And for a homogeneous Poisson process, we know that for complete spatial randomness, uh, uh, the, 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 the K function is going to follow uh, uh, pi r squared. I mean, that's pretty easy to see that, you know, the more uh, bigger circle you take, the more points you cover, right? So this can be used, uh, and then there is a common transformation of this function called the L function that takes this into a linear scale. And then we can plot it uh, to see that if uh, there is a clustered pattern or a dispersed pattern. So uh, when, you, when we have this L function for the random distribution, L distribution, we can see that how the patterns are, uh, are, are uh, uh, clustered or dispersed. And you can use this L function to understand, to see that if there is an inhibition radius or not. This is just a pure statistics. We can do some optimization on this uh, function to see that where exactly is the optimal radius for our point pattern. And uh, so we have the two measures now. One is that you have the statistics called the L function that can provide uh, uh, the measures. And also you have the Geyer process, right? Uh, like I said, you know, we can fit the model. So what we can try to do is that now we can analyze the metric 
uh, L function and the G function uh, uh, together. And that's where machine learning comes in, right? So we can do an unsupervised analysis of this metric LRGR. And uh, we, can, we can try to identify if there are natural clusters in there, uh, in that data. So this is, a, this is an optimal number of clusters uh, that I found that there are two clusters. There are 411 patients in there. Each data point is, a, uh, each data point is the L function and the, uh, the GR radius that we get. And uh, I found that there are in fact two complete sets of population. And I wanted to see if there was a survival difference and indeed, indeed there were survival differences. So these, pa these patients, the cells were not too clustered. And for these patients, the cells were too clustered. So the people who had the cells clustering tend to die earlier than people who uh, did not have the cells clustering, right? So uh, I also tried to smooth the data to get a more better approx um, estimate. And then uh, th that, that revealed even more uh, nice pattern in there. There were two uh, uh, complete uh, uh, populations in here that, that showed different types of uh, point patterns uh, when, when, when using this apply gear process on their uh, pathology images. Right, and I associated this with the gene signatures and pathways using RNA-seq data. So we now know how to combine all these. Uh, there are methods to uh, understand the gene expression. And then I found that there were like key genes uh, that were uh, involved in cell movement and proliferation pathways. So these were the two sets of gene signatures uh, that I found uh, to be actively involved is the actin cytoskeleton pathway and rho A signaling pathway. And these are extremely important pathways for locomotion, right? So, and then that led me to this contact inhibition of locomotion. So both uh, CAL and CAP are important mechanism for cancer progression and CAP is a hallmark of cancer in fact. Uh, CA, there is this uh, contact inhibition of proliferation has been very, very famous. Uh, it's one of the hallmarks of cancer, but um, CAL was largely ignored because it's hard to do in vivo experiments to study the locomotion. Although it was characterized in the 1950s, and uh, there were two modes of CIL. One is called the homotypic, and then the other is called the heterotypic CIL. And the loss of heterotypic CIL has been proposed as a mechanism for tumor invasion and metastasis, while tumor cells uh, in themselves maintain homotopic contact inhibition. You can think of if this is the same tumor, this is the same tumor, it's going to ripple. But if it is a normal under tumor tissue, it's going to uh, uh, invade. And that's uh, the mechanism behind cancer, right? Uh, and then uh, it also makes sense from a mathematical perspective because tumor invasion is essentially a, a birth and death process of rapidly dividing cells. So we know that uh, we know uh, the, the tumors are usually modeled as a spatial birth and death process. And in fact, the Gibbs process is an equilibrium process of spatial birth and death. So it makes perfect sense from a mathematical perspective of how these, right? Why don't we get cancer? Because there is a natural inhibition that happens so that is the essence of the Gibbs process is that there is an inhibition. If there, is, there are more cells that are going to be born and they are going to die, at some point there is going to be an equilibrium and the cells are not going to invade on each other. That is why we don't get cancer in the first place. But, but if that mechanism is screwed up, that's when this aggregation takes place and uh, uh, we get cancer. And so uh, uh, summarizing all this, it's a very, very powerful mathematical framework for studying the behavior of cells and uh, marked point processes with covariates can practically model all aspects of cell behavior through data integration, uh, including omics data. So we can extract images from pre videos and use spatial point processes. It's extremely applicable in developmental biology. And it's a logical next step uh, to study uh, uh, immune response through spatial point process framework. And uh, it, you know, we can uh, uh, estimate the relative risk of proliferation. It's cost effective when used with training techniques and it's uh, translational from bench to bedside. Uh, translation is very easy and it can be put in the framework of AI and emergent systems. It's the logical next steps for biology. Uh, these are more, um, I don't want to go into the details of how this uh, can be integrated with uh, uh, neural networks, but, but it can be done. And there is an excellent book called The Spatial Point Patterns. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not biologically oriented though, uh, but there are lots of examples and it's pretty uh, 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 straightforward to some, apply some of these methods. So uh, I, as for the preprint, you can go into this uh, preprint that I have uh, uploaded in BioArchive. Uh, it, uh, it goes by Gibbs process determines um, uh, uh, survival and reveals contact inhibition genes in glioblastoma multiforme.
And with that, uh, this work was largely done uh, with, uh, with inputs. I collaborated with my um, uh, uh, collaborator, Jason Hughes. He's in, uh, he is here, an associate professor in translational molecular pathology. He's a neuropathologist. And Adriana Higgy from uh, uh, NYU. And, part of, uh, and most of this work was done when I was at NYU, uh, after which I, um, uh, I transitioned to MD Anderson Cancer Center. So with that, I would end this talk and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have and uh, I will open the floor for a discussion. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us. This is incredible information and I know the audience is giving you a huge virtual round of applause. All right, thank you. Okay, so I hope that's all done. So yeah. Uh, so for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. And along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and check out our amazing AI exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around. All right, thank you, bye-bye.